So, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends, anybody I've forgotten, welcome to the closing plenary of, the, um, of this conference. And our topic for this afternoon is the way ahead. How to manage complex societal security challenges in the Baltic Sea region. Uh, so we've been talking since we were set going yesterday afternoon by Foreign Minister Margot Wallström along this road of uh, interrelated issues, different levels at which to be working, challenging problems to re resolve, an institutional framework is there and how to make the best of it. And that's what we, where we want to focus now, the, the way ahead and the work to do. So to, do, to help us do that, I have a really, really quite outstanding closing panel. Sitting next to me is uh, Cyril Kozachewski, the political director of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Poland. Next to Cyril is uh, Karin Enström, member of parliament, uh, member of the Swedish Riksdag. Next one along, Audun Halversen, the uh, State Secretary of the Ministry for Foreign Affairs of Norway. Then Annika Söder, uh, State Secretary, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Sweden. And at the end, Ulrich Vestergaard Knudsen, State Secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Denmark. So this is really, um, you know, a quite, let's say, serious, distinguished high-powered panel to be, to be talking through these issues. Uh, when we get to the end of this session, then uh, stay in your seats. There's just going to be uh, a final wrap-up for the last um, 15, 20 minutes um, with Margaret Wallström coming back again to, in a sense, hear where we got to uh, over, over the last day or so. So let's dive into the conversation straight away. And let me put it to you straightforwardly, blunt question. What societal security challenges does Poland see uh, in the Baltic Sea region? And I'll ask you this, the follow-up to that, which is what's the vision of the best way to respond to them afterwards? So set, set the problems out from a Polish government perspective. Let me start from congratulating uh, organizers for ambitious meeting and uh, and high quality of uh, discussions and uh, debates yesterday and and uh, and today um, I'm regarded as uh, as uh, hard security um, uh, a policy expert but uh, uh, the fact that we speak here about um, um, societal soft uh, uh, security challenges uh, does not mean that uh, those challenges are uh, less hard to address. Um, uh, um, in fact, uh, hard sec security challenges uh, um, uh, intersect uh, in the region with the um, soft uh, security, uh, security risks. Um, uh, yesterday, um, I've heard um, some experts uh, um, um, uh, referring to the um, very um, uh, destabilizing uh, um, risks um, that uh, that are affecting uh, the region, uh, and they um, refer to uh, destabilization uh, in our eastern neighborhood, uh, also to growing uh, militarization uh, in the. Baltic Sea region, uh, as well as uh, to attacks on cyber infrastructure. So those are the examples of those uh, challenges uh, which uh, we should be aware because they influencing, influencing uh, directly the security challenges that we were discussing, discussing yesterday and today in, in the panels. Some of them are directly related to the topics that were raised uh, today, mm -hmm. like, for example, nuclear security, the stabilization <laughs> in, the, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in some areas brings the, um, to our, should bring to our attention the uh, dangers of uh, illicit uh, um, uh, smuggling uh, of, 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 of nuclear, nuclear um, um, uh, nuclear elements, uh, products uh, uh, to, to to our countries. We have to we have to all address it. Uh, as Poland, we have to um, also be careful in uh, uh, in the messages uh, uh, around uh, building uh, 
nuclear um, uh, uh, civilian uh, capacities. Uh, so we have to ensure the uh, the uh, population, the citizens, that it, if the decision is taken, uh, the uh, construction will be uh, undertaken within the, the strongest possible regime um, uh, uh, as, 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 uh, as it's possible. But of course, there are other other topics uh, discussed um, uh, today uh, in the panels that are relevant uh, for uh, uh, in, uh, in 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 Polish uh, uh, um, uh, foreign and internal policy preoccupations, especially when it comes to addressing them uh, them in the forum of. Uh, Baltic uh, uh, Sea uh, region, uh, like climate change, uh, uh, especially uh, uh, focused, uh, uh, climate change ad adaptation, especially focused on urban areas. Uh, we we undertaken some planning uh, to address that uh, in the cities uh, um, um, uh, above uh, 100,000 uh, inhabitants. Uh, uh, the um, efforts uh, to ensure a healthy uh, Baltic Sea, growing tourist uh, infrastructure uh, is something that uh, uh, it cannot be uh, 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 like, uh, 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 cannot be uncontrolled. Uh, additionally, there are other preoccupations like growing infrastructure in the Baltic Sea. Uh, there are uh, additional uh, preoccupations about uh, a, a chemical weapons mm -hmm. that that, uh, that 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 is there. So those are the issues that 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 we uh, that we have to um, address in communicating with the um, uh, with uh, with population. Uh, Gender-based uh, violence, uh, um, uh, as it constitutes uh, an attack on the principles of uh, equality and uh, dignity. Uh, requires uh, special uh, um, uh, attention. The challenges here that while we uh, are focused on combating it, combating it uh, at home, in schools and in public spaces, there is there is uh, uh, another preoccupation. It's uh, it's uh, spreading to the um, uh, it's expanding to the cyberspace. Mm. So we need to use uh, um, uh, uh, different tools to, uh, to, uh, to address this, uh, this issue. So those are examples um, um, how, how we uh, um, uh, should, how, how important it is to uh, address the, those, those challenges also in holistic way. Uh, uh, but some of them are immediate, so they they are uh, they are differ uh, they different in terms of in intensity. Oh. And a couple a couple of examples of what you think are the or experiences the best ways to deal with them. Uh, I uh, as I've heard um, um, uh, yesterday, and also I've as I've. Uh, Prepared for for the meeting and to look through the uh, uh, various various documents, I I I I, um, I saw the um, concept that is uh, already um, present here. Um, I've heard that from 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 various speak speakers to establish uh, a common uh, societal security um, culture. And that speaks to me uh, particularly because um, uh, uh, for the last uh, um, several years, I, um, I was uh, uh, appointed as uh, ambassador uh, to, uh, to Japan. And there, um, uh, you, can, you can see very high level of, of the uh, societal uh, uh, security uh, security culture um, that stems from the realization that uh, there is a whole range of risk, immediate like uh, earthquakes, uh, and um, um, uh, and uh, uh, we, we we know all about uh, the example of, of, of Fukushima. Fukushima Fukushima disaster, 
but they also um, uh, they 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 uh, they very much uh, uh, in a holistic way uh, prepare society. Society prepares itself for the for the um, um, challenges of extended nature, mm -hmm. like uh, uh, aging uh, population. So this realization of of the um, uh, community, sense of community, and uh, sense of uh, um, a common uh, uh, interest uh, helps uh, this society to overcome or to address uh, a very important issue. And um, s similarly here in, in the region, the societal security culture should be result of high sense of community and and inter interdependence how how the, the question is however here uh, how to how to build this uh, sense of community mm -hmm. um, uh, we 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 probably have uh, and this is something that uh, also um, i've heard uh, today we might have um, sufficient architecture of institution institutions to address uh, uh, those uh, issues uh, uh, and challenges. So um, um, it is also important to seek the other ways yeah. to, to address the, uh, those, those issues. And I, I, I remember yesterday uh, Director uh, Neverov from the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, he was referring to the uh, arena of conflicts, uh, rivalry, but also cooperation. And every one of us was thinking that he is, is starting to, 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 uh, to speak about uh, Baltic Sea region, but he then pointed to the World Cup. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I think, um, I think he, had, he, he, he made an important point here. Um, what is how what, what we could do to, to bring that kind of uh, focus of interests as the World Cup is bringing uh, every every four, 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 four years that requires uh, a, in my in my mind uh, 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 three elements uh, you you need to have um, um, stars mm -hmm. uh, that uh, uh, bring uh, public attention. You need to play at the highest possible level. Uh, so you need to be well skilled, well trained. And the third element, you have to have uh, public interest television in place. Right. Uh, and what it re how, how it refers to 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 the Baltic Sea uh, region, uh, I think we could consider also um, uh, three elements that could be very instrumental. Uh, uh, um, one, and I've heard it uh, as well, to build curricul curriculum mm -hmm. uh, um, in high schools and universities mm -hmm. that uh, will be pointing toward challenges and uh, trying to uh, uh, address the uh, communicate these this challenges from the to the to the youngster the second one is to uh, build a, maybe a TV channel or media uh, uh, or sp uh, to build some some mm -hmm. some 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 media uh, that could uh, um, inform uh, about opportunities in uh, all the all the uh, all the all the countries uh, in the region, and uh, so also uh, and also uh, to be used by um, in, in in regions in the in the countries on the regional level. Yeah. Okay, uh, great. If we can just move on and bring the others into the conversation as well, could I ask uh, Ulrich Vaskot uh, Knudsen? Could you um, pick out? within this range of issues, something that you think it is, is worth focusing on, perhaps both because it's a serious problem 
and also because maybe there are some there are some successes to be found there. I think uh, I think my Polish colleague has already almost exhausted the list of possible societal threats to the Baltic Sea region. But I think perhaps there's one you didn't mention, and I'm not sure how much it's been a topic over the last two days since I arrived this morning. But I haven't I haven't heard anything about it, and that's cyber. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think if you combine what's been established as a fact by many already today, uh, that there is a lot of military tension in the Baltic Sea region, perhaps more than ever since the end of the Cold War. If you combine that fact with, with another fact, that this is perhaps the most highly uh, digitized uh, region in the world, and not only the Nordic countries, but the Baltic countries and, and, and others, uh, cybersecurity becomes more and more of a, of a, of a, of a vulnerability for us. Of course, uh, a high degree of uh, internet penetration and so on is in itself a good thing. But if you compare it with the military tension that's already there, um, it, 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 it is actually a vulnerability that is perhaps a little bit overlooked as a, as a common uh, threat to the Baltic uh, uh, Sea countries. Um, Denmark, for one, has, uh, we've, we've, I think we've already, already been also been a little bit late in, in realizing this, but now it has been identified in public by our National Intelligence Service as the number one threat to Danish uh, security. I, I think uh, their intelligence colleagues in, 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 uh, in countries uh, in this panel would, uh, would agree. Um, it's also something that has received uh, a, a quite, uh, quite a large sum in the new National Danish uh, Defense Agreement with cross-party uh, uh, agreement. So I think this is a topic that we need to pay more attention to. And it's, uh, it's perhaps in some ways even more of an imminent threat than the military tension we talk about. Uh, you will find also people in Denmark who think that, uh, that, that, that war is imminent and the Russians will be uh, flying over Copenhagen next week. I don't think so. Uh, I don't believe so. Um, but we have to admit that cyber attacks, hacking, uh, propaganda, disinformation, that is already a fact of our political lives today. Uh, so it's not something, it's perhaps even wrong to dub it as a threat because it's not something that may be here one day. It is here, it's a daily, uh, it's something we live with every day. So I, I would probably point to that. Yes, there were, I mean, there was a head of British uh, intelligence who said that the first blow in the next war will be in cyberspace. And the response to him was, it's already happened. Mm -hmm. I think that, that that's the worrying thing about the, the cyber field, is that sense of it at least blurring the distinction between peace and, <coughs> and war that we've, we've long thought about. But to what degree can a regional response to this be, be developed? Do you, th do you think that is a, a pleasant add-on to what Denmark does, or do you think it is effectively a, a necessary condition for effective action on this? I think we, we have to be honest here uh, in two ways. One is that we don't really know what is the right international form for this. Two, um, the Baltic, uh, or the CBSS is probably not uh, the one where we're going to find answers to these questions. I think that's the honest answer. But we have started looking for answers uh, through uh, an innovative uh, tech diplomacy. Uh, we have invented uh, or, or appointed, if you like, the first uh, tech ambassador in the world to see if we can start a dialogue between countries and big uh, companies, which is part of this, of course, uh, also. We've also already heard about Cambridge Analytica and so on. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm moving perhaps a little bit away from, from, away from the mainstream cyber attack agenda here, but this is, uh, this is a new uh, area uh, for diplomats we would probably start looking for answers in the UN, in the EU, in, in NATO perhaps, uh, and not the CBSS, but, uh, but, but, but that's also an interesting discussion. We have so many fora, but where are we going to address uh, these yeah. issues? I would not pretend to have the answer here today. Karen, Karen Enström, how do you, s I mean, picking up on this issue if you, if you want to or moving on, but how do you see societal security cooperation developing in the, in the coming years? Um, well, in the region. Yes, in the region. Well, to start with, I mean, it's, it's I think we have to, um, to make it not just, I say, a level playing field, but a level f f a field uh, or um, kind of a, um, identifying and trying to streamline how, how does the world look like? Uh, where are the threats? And that's, that's, that we are already doing that, and I think we're doing that in quite a good way, exchanging views, trying to learn from each other. But I think the trick now is to take it 
to the next level. And, I, and the whole conference has partly been about this. How do we now implement? We know what the threats are, and we can see that security, I mean, that is a, it's a, it's a core task for a society. If you cannot protect your citizens, then the citizens start to, to doubt you. They start to, start to be skeptical and suspicious. And so if you cannot deliver, if you don't have that leverage, then, um, then you can start to, to really doubt the whole, the whole idea of, well, govern a country or a region. So if we start with identifying in a clear way uh, what are the threats, <coughs> Uh, and then, I think, in, in try to find methods. Um, I mean, most of these issues, they are, they are not new. They've been used, but not maybe at the same time and at this very high-skilled technical level. Um, we know that there are um, forces, uh, actors out there who are willing to use every method that they can. Um, maybe not to to attack us and, and invade us, but they are more than prepared and are doing it right now, trying to affect and destabilize uh, our societies. And that is now also affecting the trust. Mm. And trust is extremely, I think that's the foundation for everything. Mm. So when we lose the trust, mm. then we have uh, lost, I would say, half the battle. Um, so um, I don't want to see the different areas between soft security and hard security to compete because we're going to need both of them uh, more than, than ever. Uh, and we know also that when things happening will happen, we don't know if it's, is it war, is it peace, is this gray zone um, situation that we have to be very aware of. And that's why I think the only way to try to, um, we, don't, we cannot stop, but to, to um, to safeguard our societies is to cooperate. And as we know, there are a lot of different regional cooperation, well, regional institutions here. Uh, is that a problem or is it maybe uh, something, an advantage that on different levels and a little bit of different, um, well, how can I say, uh, applications, you can use our common knowledge uh, in a better way. Okay. But that, but for to be able to do that, we have to, as I said, identify the threats, but also then prioritize. Be very clear on what, what then is our main uh, tasks. And when you know that, <laughs> then it's easier to, to, get, to, to step forward. So are you suggesting some kind of you know, a division of labor between the different institutions that are available? Yeah, but, but I think the division of labor is already there. We have so many different institutions some of them overlap, and I don't, I'm not sure that that is a problem. Maybe it's, it's a good thing, but to maybe use our, um, uh, both when it comes to, um, to research and development, um, uh, to use that kind of knowledge better, mm -hmm. to share it with, uh, with, uh, with our partners, with our neighbors. Uh, but also be very clear, on what, what is the priorities? What would be the core issues to, to start with? Yeah, it's a good question. What would the core issues be to start with? Uh, to start with is to, I would say, is to, um, to, to in a way, um, upgrade uh, the um, a little bit of, uh, how can I say, shivering trust at the moment. Right. Uh, and to be very clear, on when we have a, well, not just a message, but that, that we have a real trust between the voters and uh, and well government, but in a, in a more of not just government, but uh, on the governmental yeah. side. I too. think both you and Cyril are, t are touching on the similar thing when Cyril talks about societal security and draws a little bit on the uh, exper his experience in Japan, and you talk about trust between citizens and government and trust within communities. We're talking about something which is the sort of the context within which good policy can happen and can, can, can be effectuated. It's, it's, it's really interesting. Um, Aldun, if I can move to you. <coughs> Norway, you know, on the edge of the Baltic region. How, how, do the, how do the issues in the Baltic Sea region connect to <coughs> other aspects of, of Norwegian policy? I mean, you know, related parts of Norwegian policy that are very important 
to Norway are, for example, to do with the oceans, mm. right? uh, to do with the natural environment. So how, how do those connections look, look to you in the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs? Well, first of all, of course, we are also discussing all the issues that we have been discussing here because these are, uh, I think, challenges to all our societies. They are not limited, so to say, in, in a regional manner. But uh, I think they also connect uh, sort of in an overarching way with, uh, with, an, with the issue of the ocean, as you mentioned, which is a key priority for us. And that goes both when it comes to policy and also in the sort of very literal uh, geographic uh, way. And, and to start with that, I think if you look at the, uh, at the geography in itself, there is a very strong sort of blue thread from the oceans, you know, starting in the Arctic, the high north, uh, the Barents Sea, the North Sea, Skagerrak, uh, Kattegat, also going into the Bay of Botnia and, and the Gulf of Finland. Uh, and that runs as sort of as a, as a thread through both our uh, history and, of course, obviously our geography. And, and we know that this maritime domain has been, you know, it's, it's a source of food, food security, it's a source of energy and energy security. Uh, it's important for, and has been important over history for strategic protection, uh, trade, uh, communication, the connectiv connectivity issues. Uh, and of course, the, the oceans are also a strong part of our uh, national ident identities for, for many of us. Uh, and if you start with the economic value and I think the potential, you know, it's, it's huge. Uh, take the Norwegian oceans, which are you know, more than seven times as large as the uh, Norwegian land territory, uh, almost as large as the Mediterranean. Uh, they represent two-thirds of Norway's uh, export revenue. Mm. Uh, energy, of course, uh, aquaculture, fishing, uh, uh, and energy, of course, as I, as I mentioned. Then there is the, what should I say, classical uh, element of, of uh, defense, uh, hard security. Uh, we see the, the maritime domain has sort of re-emerged as, uh, as an arena for strategic competition, especially in the North Atlantic and also in the Baltic Sea. Uh, lifeline between allies across the Atlantic. Uh, and we also see, from our perspective, you know, developments, especially in the high North and North Atlantic, there's also a very clear security implications potentially for the Baltic in this hard uh, military uh, perspective. Uh, and I think also acknowledging the, the role of the maritime domain in this uh, in the more soft or broad security field that we have been discussing. Uh, you know, the, the roots of trade are obviously there, but also the roots of smuggling, trafficking, uh, environmental crime, economic crime, etc. So, uh, of course, there are the environmental issues. Uh, we know that the Baltic Sea is facing uh, particular, uh, some particular uh, environmental uh, problems. And of course, these need to be addressed and only, can only be addressed in a cooperative manner. And we have the instruments, as I think, uh, as we have been discussing earlier today. Uh, this, uh, the, the uh, CBSS, uh, you have the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region, you have the Helsinki uh, Convention on the Environmental Issues. And I think this is an, um, a very important uh, arena for cooperation, and it goes to show that uh, some uh, of the uh, broader uh, issues can only be addressed uh, in, in a wider format. So we, I think we know, uh, all of us, that uh, we have lived with the oceans, for the oceans, for, for centuries as countries and, and nations. And I think that we, we understand that a large part of our prosperity, our stability in the region, uh, depends on uh, our ability to manage the oceans in a sustainable way. And I think that's also, uh, you know, uh, we have seen uh, a growth of, of the uh, maritime cooperation over the last years, and I, I think that's a very good development. So for us, striking the balance between a sustainable use of the ocean and a healthy ocean is a key priority. We know that uh, fisheries, seafood uh, managed in a sustainable way is vital to actually feed the world's population in the coming uh, years as with the uh, population increase. And we know that illegal fishing and uh, uh, environmental crime in this area can also lead to both uh, economic depression mm -hmm. in certain areas and also potentially societal problems. So uh, the, the management of these resources is actually very good prevention in this sort of broader security sense as well. And uh, just to take one very concrete example, we have seen uh, uh, fisheries, for example. Uh, we had the Arctic cod for dinner uh, last night. It was an excellent meal by the way. <laughs> but, but let me use that as an example, because 
this is an area where Russia and Norway together probably has the best managed fish stocks in the world. And that is a result of years of very close cooperation uh, on the scientific level, uh, on then using the scientific uh, data to, to inform policy, and a very close cooperation. So from uh, a historic low about 20 years ago, uh, the stock is now more than tenfold with a value of more than two billion uh, US dollars a year. So uh, it really goes to show the, the very practical value of, of this cooperation. Uh, of course, uh, climate change. Uh, we are Arctic nations, many of us. Uh, we have, a, regrettably, a front row uh, view of uh, the uh, rapid and increasing uh, climatic changes. Uh, we went to Greenland a couple of weeks ago. Uh, really impressive, but also uh, not, not just the two of us. We oh. <laughs> <laughs> For the 10-year uh, the anniversary of the Lulisat Declaration, yeah. which uh, is also an important instrument. But if you sort of combine all these factors, you see that the the oceans is really a focal point you know, for the hard security agenda, for the softer security agenda, for economic prosperity, and also for the uh, environmental and... Uh, yeah. So I want to take agenda. you to one aspect of that, which we've also been discussing in breakout sessions, which is the Arctic, where in a sense the, the oceans, climate change, cooperation, Russia and Norway and, and others all come together. What, what do you think the prospects are now? Where, where does the situation stand as far as you know, ideas and initiatives like the Northern Sea Route mm. now, now stand? Is the, is the world changing that much? Or, yeah, what, what's the Norwegian perspective on, on these <coughs> issues? Well, I, th I think just to, to take the Northern Route and developments in the Arctic, I think this is one of the areas where we might have been, you know, we are thinking. We think the changes will be more radical than they actually will be in the short term, but we are perhaps we haven't thought through the long-term mm -hmm. strategic implications. Uh, so th just, to just to how, start. How long do you think the short term and the long term are in that? Thing? Short I think term, a decade, and long term? Decades, yeah. both. Yeah. Uh, but I, I would start by, by saying that you know, the, the Arctic is an area of stability. I think it's in yeah. all uh, the actors' interest to keep it that way. Uh, on the uh, the uh, anniversary of the Lulusat Declaration really showed that the the uh, policy of high north low tension uh, managing uh, the area managing potential disagreements within the framework of the law of the sea uh, is still functioning. There is a strong will, I think, among the Arctic countries to maintain that. Uh, and even though we are seeing uh, you know developments in the military sphere as well. Uh, we have been able to sort of maintain the, the Arctic uh, framework, so to say, as a, uh, uh, a framework, as an arena for constructive discussions and constructive pragmatic cooperation of the uh, kind that I, I think we also would like to see right. uh, even more of in the Baltic region. So, so Annika, Annika, if I come to you, you're coming to uh, the end, or Sweden is coming to the end of the year of presidency of the... Uh, the Council of the Baltic Sea States, yeah. And so, what is what's your perspective? And from the from the chair of that conference or that council, what's your perspective on the societal security challenges, and how have you been handling them together uh, with the with the other governments over the past year? Thank you for that question. Actually, we're leaving the presidency to Latvia already next week. Yeah. Uh, so we've had a year an important year and, and I would like to say that this is um, somewhat instrumental my view in the sense that the example that Audun mentioned of fisheries in the North Sea and the collaboration between Russia and Norway there or the work that we've been conducting for years uh, when it comes to water waste management in the Baltic Sea they are both very important for our citizens and have good results for food for the environment and so forth. But they are also there to build trust and collaboration where this may lack uh, in uh, the present uh, reality. Uh, so all of the societal challenges that we've discussed here today and yesterday are of key importance to the citizens, but they are also uh, opportunities for collaboration. Uh, and here I see the, the CBSS, the Council of the Baltic Sea States, <coughs> as important because it brings in Russia, uh, that is uh, 
part of the tension, military tension, in the Baltic Sea, increased military tension that we've seen over the last uh, uh, years, and where we believe that through uh, dealing with soft security uh, together, we can also build the trust between countries, but we, by also bringing trust mm. nationally and locally with the uh, concrete examples or challenges that we are working on. So this would be our take on this. And as Beng Sundelius said yesterday, uh, soft security is hard security because it needs a lot of time and patience and persistence in order to actually arrive at that. So this is how we see the importance of the CBSS. But I also wanted to say that um, if we look at the global context, because I see there are many uh, representatives of countries outside of, of this region, um, this region is very well placed to take forward all the agreements that we made in the happy year of 2015 on disaster risk reduction, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals Agenda 2030, trade, uh, the climate agreement. And I think we can make a commitment to, even if agreements globally break down, this region can continue to work in this way and by that also show an example. And Auden, I again <laughs> mentioned the oceans. Uh, people come to Norway and Sweden to ask how do we deal with the oceans issue in the context of the Agenda 2030. They come to Estonia and Denmark to talk about digitalization. So we also have something to offer and if we do that together that would further create this trust between us and uh, the, the common identity, including um, the three bigger countries that we, the smaller ones, should be happy to work with, Poland, uh, Germany, and, and, Russia. and Russia. And, and I was going to raise, but you've already touched on it, maybe you'd like to develop a bit more, There's the question of trust is important, but how do you develop trust? How can you build trust? And I think I'm right in hearing that your, your answer to that question would be, well, you register achievements. And these achievements are in the interests of ordinary people, and they are done cooperatively, and through that you build trust. It, it, is that right, or am I oversimplifying? Maybe you're somewhat <laughs> oversimplifying. Uh, I believe we need to add to this uh, also people-to-people -people contacts, youth, as my foreign minister was talking about yesterday, and to foster uh, more of a sense of commonality and interest in issues of future importance uh, in the younger generations, uh, yeah. common curricula and so forth, just to, to give, an, give an example. Mm -hmm. But of course, to register achievements is really creating uh, commonality and trust. But coming back to... Um, societal challenges that we all face also individually, but that have repercussions regionally and globally, I believe is the matter of social cohesion. Right. Uh, growing gaps um, in countries, and actually Karin was also referring to that, how can we avoid populism uh, together, and how can we create the welfare that is demanded uh, in such a way that we recreate um, cohesion in countries and between countries. Well, Ulrich, you had a... I just wanted to, to build on what uh, Audun and, uh, and Annika just said, uh, the importance of, uh, of regional cooperation, um, because I think it's, it's, it's pretty evident that even though we've all discussed the military tension, and we all agree that military tension is higher than it has been for decades, um, it is important to sit down in regional fora because we nobody would argue that the Arctic Council has a lot of value. We know what to do in the Arctic Council. It has a certain niche, and it's actually an area where we have managed to increase cooperation also with Russia over the last 10 years. That's why we tel celebrated the 10-year anniversary of mm. the Iluliset Declaration. Actually, the cornerstone of that is that we're going to live together peacefully. We're going to sort of uh, uh, try to see if we can find peaceful uh, solutions to, to even territorial conflicts in the, in the Arctic. So it's interesting that even as military tension may rise in some fora, you have these other fora where you can still have low tension uh, areas. This could potentially 
also be a role for the CBSS. I'm not sure the CBSS is living up to its uh, potential uh, at full speed uh, right now, despite the efforts of our Swedish uh, friends. But just to stress the point that regional fora uh, can have uh, can have uh, supplementary uh, uh, roles, and you can actually have cooperation working well in in one, while not perhaps as well in. in, in yeah, I, th I mean, I think it's a very important point to grasp that behind the headlines of tensions and problems and so on, there is also an equal reality of cooperation and of institutions which are being looked after. In a moment, I'm going to again turn to the audience and um, uh, invite questions. So I hope there's a roving mic around. Can somebody assure me there's a roving mic to be found? But in the, in the meantime, first of all, out on you. No, just point. picking up on, on Ulrich's point, uh, because and, and using a Norwegian example again, a Norwegian-Russian example. Uh, it's uh, even in some areas that are you know, comparatively hard, uh, I would say, in this uh, new uh, environment and in the new uh, relations, we have been able to maintain uh, a, a good pragmatic cooperation. Uh, search and rescue, for example, which is a military, uh, as it is uh, uh, operated by the military on the Norwegian side. Mm -hmm. Uh, Coast Guard Corporation, which is Norwegian Coast Guard FSB Corporation, border management, which is the same, and also military to military communication lines. So it is possible, it takes hard work and, and dedication, I think, from both sides, but uh, there is an opening there. So There's a question here at the front. Where's the... Yeah, right there. Good. Yeah, Mr. Rao uh, I would like to uh, bring you, or from the floor, a takeaway uh, relating to the question of trust, which you, as a chair, uh, exposed to us with. Uh, from the non-proliferation community and the practitioner, uh, I am defining the trust. It first of all relates to the assurances which we are able to give to the society. And that leads to um, management confidence which is in the institutional levels experienced. And that confidence is based on trust. Confidence is trust based mm -hmm. on proven reliability of the one and the thing. And that gives us then a strong uh, process where we can see is all these conditions available. And that we can then be uh, able to see how well we have been uh, managing uh, and succeed, success, having a success in our, uh, our engagement. That is a definition from the non-proliferation community about the trust. Thank, thanks very much. Anybody want to comment? We can move. There's another question right here, just two persons along. Thank you very much for that, sir. Sorry, uh, Mandy Sangira from the UK. Um, one of my questions is, um, it's about how do we engage the next generation? How do we get you from the Baltic states involved with conferences and um, kind of get involved with the 2030 agenda? I mean, I regularly speak at the UN and all over the world, and one of the things that I find is that at there isn't many youth from the Baltic states or Sweden taking part at those global conferences. There's a conference happening in Bulgaria next month, which I'm attending. But again, it's children who can afford to attend, will attend. So how do we make it a level playing field for the next generation? How do we lift them off the sticky floor to kind of aim to smash the glass ceiling globally? And... I'd like people in this conference to maybe make a pledge or call for an action that if we're in a position to help the next generation, that we do that. Okay. Karen. Um, very good question. Um, and uh, um, I think from, from the Nordic side, resources is not the, the issue. Um, and maybe you should... Well, I think... It's, if you start on a regional level, it's probably more easy than to to travel very far and to very high-level uh, conferences. Uh, I, I'm sure that the engagement from from the next generation is is very very strong. But then I think the the question I don't have a good answer to that is how to then channel this engagement. Um, I mean the the means are the technical means with uh, with the the, the 
Can you can you hand if we're going to say this quickly? But okay, sorry, I won't take another moment after this. Um, what it is, what I found is that a lot of young people have the passion and the drive, and they really want to get involved with social issues affecting them in their home country. So I always say think global but act local and young people really get that however um, sometimes they're not given the real opportunity so if they want to get into politics they want to get involved into law um, sometimes um, they feel like they, they just don't meet that criteria they don't fit in so maybe look at mentoring looking at making real opportunities for young people because that's something that I'm kind of really driven and passionate about really for young people Karen, I, I agree and I, I'll, I'll I'll take that uh, as a, uh, a demand to act. <laughs> yeah, Annika, do you have? I mean, I mean, the, the the question, in a way, it goes beyond thinking about societal security, but it's clearly connected to it because one of the things that we've been talking about earlier is about engaged citizenship, and one of the aspects of that which we touched on yesterday, we followed through, is about information, understanding, knowledge, as a one way to help uh, get engagement from ordinary people. One component of that, and a lot of people comment on this and there's a lot of discussion about it, is whether or not people whom I'm now old enough to call young are getting engaged in a way that we kind of seem to think we were 30 years ago in, in political issues, in social issues, in action in NGOs and so on. I mean, do you think this is a real problem? Are there obvious solutions? Do you have those solutions? If so, please just lay them out on the stage in well, front of us. Maybe we are old enough to think that young people are not in exactly. a position to yes. engage. So maybe we should ask somebody that is actually young. There are so many instruments available. Uh, I'm thinking of the Erasmus, for example, that has if we talk about creating contacts, how it has worked in the European Union and beyond. And I could mention that we uh, recently, uh, celebrating the, the 100 years of the three Baltic countries, we uh, also launched a, a joint fund to actually support uh, exchange between young people. And I hope that the vision group that is now working uh, to present their work uh, to the ministers next week, that they will also come up with more practical solutions on people-to-people uh, contacts, but because that is a very important foundation. Then, of course, it's not only about people meeting, but also engaging mm. in the challenges that we have just discussed. But isn't this also combined with what was said from the non-proliferation <laughs> community, namely how trust is created by assurances, because that is in a way what politics is about. It's about making uh, compacts and commitments, be it at the local, national, or regional or global level and then live up to the assurances so that those that are affected by them can actually trust that they will be lived uh, up to. And if that is not any longer the case, what would young people then uh, do? And in this very unpredictable world where agreements are challenged and broken uh, on a weekly basis, it's of course yeah. really up to us that can influence at least our neighborhood or the European Union to take on this challenge. I, I'm not worried about engaging uh, the young. I think the young generation is, uh, is very, very engaged, perhaps in different ways than our generation. They use different tools. Uh, they use uh, social media. They have a different engagement. Every generation has a different uh, engagement. If I were to, to, to spend a lot of time discussing a problem of engagement, it would not be with the young generation. It would be closing the gap between people in this room and then the people uh, in democracies and also in non-democracies not understanding the need for international cooperation, the need for international trade, the need for international uh, cohesion. I think that is a two-way understanding problem. It's not just a case of us stating that that uh, oh there's a there's a there's a there's populism out there they don't understand anything mm. give them the Ricardo theorem and Adam Smith and then they'll then, then just just send them in the corner and study they're not really up to it I mean that approach will not do the trick for us uh, it, it it really won't I mean we have to be better at explaining the advantages of international cooperation I would much rather engage in discussions on how to reach that uh, audience uh, rather than reaching the young. I think the, the young are just fine. Yeah, and if I go back to something which I was told when I was young, I, my teachers was, was show me, don't tell me, show me. Don't tell me you're good, show me you're good. Don't 
tell people you're reliable and you're trustworthy, show in action. Uh, Cyril, you want yes, to? I was about to say the, the same thing. I'm, I'm, I, I can see the, the, the youngsters are very, 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 very much engaged by in a, um, in a, uh, 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 cyberspace, for example, where we, um, to certain bureaucracy is disconnected uh, uh, to a mm -hmm. certain extent with, 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 with that. There are growing number of NGOs that are addressing the things that politicians or bureaucracies overlooking for the time being. So we, we need uh, to invent some kind of interface between uh, between the uh, the young generation and 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 uh, and, uh, uh, and 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 uh, uh, polit politicians uh, and perhaps that that is a window of, of opportunity for the uh, smaller regional organizations like uh, 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 this one like uh, the organizations from, from from this region and other regions because because the the the, the heavyweight uh, 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 fighters, the bigger organizations, just have do not have uh, time in their agenda or in their uh, uh, institutions uh, to uh, to take um, their point uh, in, in, into account. So that might be also, um, uh, as I said, window of opportunity for the for, for the mm -hmm. uh, for the smaller regional uh, organizations. Take another question from the floor. There is one. <coughs> okay, try again. <laughs> it's about um, uh, about a question of uh, how we can. That is reaction to to your your comment last uh, comment. Uh, do, are we clear on uh, what we as a as an older generation and experienced generation, what we can really uh, give valuable. Uh, uh, knowledge share with the young people, and are we clear what they, re through our own experiences, what they really have to uh, experience themselves in order to learn how to cope with the future eventualities? So, are we clear in the difference between what we can valuably, valuable assets give to them and what they have to learn mm -hmm. and do by themselves? I think that is important. Thanks. Great question, and I want to pitch it to to whoever volunteers to take this on, asking you to think about it both, in a sense, institutionally or politically, but also personally. Because I was thinking as I listened to you, I've done parenthood twice over. So I have grown-up children, and I'm already a grandfather, and I have a young child. And I would say that my answer to your question, if I think about both of those essential, essentially different generations of my children, my answer to you would be no. I'm not really sure what it is that I'm supposed to be able to give. I'm not really sure what it is I'm supposed to be able to pass on. I keep on trying, but I sometimes feel that trying to pass something on is probably the wrong thing to be trying to do. And that sometimes it works best when me and my young son or when me and my older children try to learn together. So see if you can, Ulrich, challenge straight to you because you said oh, that. Oh, I decided I would refuse to answer that, cre uh, that <laughs> question. It was uh, directed at the older generation. <laughs> so I'm glad you, you took that, Dan. I'm, oh, I'm just, I'm just, uh, I'm okay, having a hard, well, hard time getting used to being 50 next year. So also answering <laughs> questions to the older generation, that's a little bit too much. But I, I was thinking along your lines, Dan, actually. I have uh, three daughters and I think you have to be very careful when you uh, sit around the dinner table and say, let me tell you uh, what you need to learn uh, going into life. I, I think you have to sort of uh, be ready to offer your experience if you're asked, and, and, and perhaps sometimes you can notch them on, um, except when they start talking about international cooperation and, and, and so on, then I can't be stopped really, uh, <laughs> but, but, but I think you're but right. If they we start talking about it, that's already good. Sure. That's already good, so we need, to, of course, to find a, a, a balance, uh, because we are also a, a, a generation that uh, has not succeeded well in international relations over the last decade. So, so, so I think they would be well placed to say, well, you're not doing everything right, are you? Uh, but, but then again, that, that also gives us a, a special position where we can say, no, but we, we have some experience then that we can pass on how not to do it. And I think that has to do with what I mentioned before about perhaps having underestimated the gap between the elite and, and the populists, if you like. I think that's a big quest, big, big issue for our uh, medium-aged generation. 
<laughs> How very tactful of you, dear boy. Uh, Annika, do you want to take up the challenge as well and we come it's along really the, the it's line? It's really difficult for me because my husband is in the audience. <laughs> so I cannot really get away with anything that I He'd always put his fingers in his ears. <laughs> um, it's a very difficult question that I struggle with almost on a daily basis, I must say. And when my my our kids uh, ask uh, what will happen now with the world that is in such a mess, I, I find myself answering that we are doing everything we can to put this back on track. But you also have to engage and do your your thing in order for this to happen. But maybe I'm a little bit too reassuring because at heart I may be more concerned that I, than I want to actually convey. Mm -hmm. Arden, your challenge? Well, just to, to take this from the sort of personal level to, to the political and, and institutional level, I think how do we, it co comes back to the question of how do we engage the young? Uh, and maybe, I think s perhaps some of the, the developments we are seeing in Western societies over the last years uh, comes from you know, taking developments, taking progress for granted. Yeah. And how do we sort of re-engage uh, on a societal level and on an institutional level in, in addressing that? Uh, I'm not sure there is a sort of clear uh, answer, uh, not a very well thought through answer anyway, but but you know, sort of going back to some of the basics of building trust, the issues we have touched upon earlier, uh, societal resilience in meeting new threats. I think this is going to be uh, uh, issues we will be uh, you know, tackling mm. for, for years to come, or generations even, because you know a lot of things, these things are really in flux, so. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Karen. Um, I'll start with more of a personal or professional, but from my former professional life as a military officer. And at that time we had uh, new conscripts every year. And they came in, day one, and you wanted to teach them everything and tell them, well, don't do that because, you know, and this will happen if you do that and that. And, but after a couple of years, I understood that you cannot just bring everything to them. You have to learn by yourself. It's... Um, Learning by doing and drawing your own conclusions. Of course, you can you can help. You can try to to manage and and um, to uh, to offer the best way of learning things and doing things and, and train things. But uh, you cannot just bring knowledge over. Uh, but if you then transform that into the society, uh, I think today it's even more important when speaking about trust, speaking about disinformation and fake news, well, how then to interpret it, interpret everything you see and read. And, and we know that young people are better in, well, looking into what kind of, which source is this? Where does this information come from? Can I trust this information or not? And people over 50 are really bad at, oh, it's in the newspaper or it's in on the, the, the web. It must be true. So, so... I mean, this, it, it connects the dot a little bit. If we don't have a, a basic knowledge and uh, a basic, a good method of, um, how can I say, to, to really classify uh, both information, news, but also um, results from research and science, then we are lost. Uh, and that's what I'm more worried about, that people don't trust science or research and development results and uh, you can you can take that to when it comes to everything from um, vaccines or uh, methods to to do to, to treat diseases or so on oh it's it's not true yeah. it's a uh, uh, this cons well, yeah. conspiracy all, all the time and, and Sarah, your take on this um, I Hearing your hesitance uh, in your voice, uh, I'm sure you uh, you successful um, in uh, bringing up uh, your, uh, uh, your 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 children. I, I think that uh, all the all we we can do as a older generation um, uh, is to um, let them let them make the, their own choices. 
And for us, um, what, is, what is left for us is to create safe um, environment for them to develop their, their own ideas. We might, uh, of course, we, we should be role models. We, we should uh, show building uh, structures as, 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 as we do uh, to um, better cooperate in order to, to ensure this, this, this uh, uh, safe uh, environment. Uh, but on the other hand, um, uh, we should not overestimate our influence uh, uh, because the, uh, we not only um, uh, ones uh, who um, um, shape their uh, uh, activities mm -hmm. or future, future choices because they have uh, their colleagues, they see, they, they read the things, they interpret uh, uh, the uh, events uh, in the remote places of, of the world. So they, they, uh, that, that is the mixture of, 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 of various experiences. For us to do is just to uh, to um, uh, to ensure the, um, the the environment for them is uh, is is safe and uh, conducive for their own uh, own choices. Yeah. Okay. So look, let's move away from the question of the generations, right? But sticking with this question, <laughs> <laughs> this this is for you, Ulrich, and I'm coming to you first, and all the burden will be upon you to answer. Sticking with the question of the divisions, but which you raised, the, is in a sense the elite, and we can think of the whether it's the policy elite or the knowledge elite, not necessarily the economic elite. I mean, one of the paradoxes of the moment is seeing members of the economic elite rise to power by attacking the elite. But we have to think about what the reality is that people see. In I think it is to do in part with a knowledge elite and a political elite, which is seen to be quite distant. So somebody mentioned, and I'm sorry I forgot who it was, but it's a very good point, this problem of having taken development and progress for granted for too long and having accepted without going into the flaws of development and progress. So for the past 40 years, the inequality indicators in Europe have been moving in the wrong direction. Right. Societies are becoming less equal, more people are being marginalized, more people are feeling left outside of that elite. And in that context then, news can be regarded as fake, scientific research can be, resulted, can be regarded as, oh, just stuff which people go on about. Where is, this is what I want to end with in a sense, where is the room for maneuver in that kind of atmosphere to be generating trust in cooperation and in the capacity of the institutions, which I believe in, but to generate trust in that capacity for them to be able to handle these complex challenges that we face. And I, I give you all just a few minutes each to have a crack at that particular nut. And you wanted me to start? And I wanted you to start. Um, because I'm generous. Right, very generous. Um, I think, I think uh, there is a glimmer of hope here as well. I think, uh, I think, all the upheavals over the last four years, which more or less also coincides with the time that, that, that Annika and I have been uh, state secretaries in Denmark and Sweden, we have seen, we've seen some, some, some pretty redefining events uh, surrounding Europe. We've seen the, uh, the appearance of uh, ISIL and perhaps also the defeat of uh, ISIL. There's been terrorism in, 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 in this town. We've seen Russian aggression in Europe for the first time since uh, the end of uh, the Cold War. We have seen uh, um, a new uh, and somewhat different uh, American president being elected. We've seen uh, Brexit. We've seen uh, migration come to the very, very uh, core of, uh, of European politics in every single uh, uh, nation. This, I think, um, is part of the reason why we are now seeing sort of perhaps a renaissance light of the European project. Uh, after Brexit, um, we all feared that there would be some sort of domino effect that now disintegration and now the, the, the rush to the exit would, uh, would sort of dominate many European countries. In fact, we have seen the opposite. We have seen in 26 out of 27 remaining countries, we have seen support for the EU project on the rise. Mm. I don't have any scientific evidence for this, but I am pretty convinced, also talking to young people, by the way, that they are sort of rediscovering uh, the EU 
but also at a larger scale, they are rediscovering international cooperation as a peace project. We can no longer afford to discuss whether we should have this or that technical standard uh, developed in, in the Commission or in the, in, the, in the Danish Parliament. That is not what's at stake here. Mm -hmm. It's something much larger at stake here. It's uncertainty coming to us from the east, from the north, from the west, from the south. So we have to stick together in Europe. We have to realize that there's only one place where we can find a commonality of interests, of values, and perhaps in the longer term also of security. And that's actually among our European uh, friends. You could perhaps extrapolate that argument also to, to the world scene, and I think, I think we are seeing some sort of renaissance of, uh, of, uh, or resurgence of hope in international cooperation. Karen, do you share that optimism? Um, that glimmer of optimism? The glimmer of hope, absolutely. And, um, um, but I think the, um, we've been, I mean, we are under pressure, and we have seen uh, our values they are being threatening from outside, but also from within. Uh, so then how to, to turn this? And I, I would like to be that optimistic. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure, but um, I guess it comes back to that we must get better in explaining why all these very, not just difficult uh, challenges, but also threats, they can only be met in cooperation and collaboration. Because even a country as the US or China uh, cannot really meet all these threats alone. Uh, and that goes then for Germany or France, and then what, what's, what's left for Sweden or Denmark or, uh, or Finland. So we, I mean, the, the challenges are so, I would say, so heavy and so complex that it, it makes the alternative just to close the border and isolate yourself, that's not a solution because, yeah. so I think that is the, the, well, the million dollar question right now. If we are able to explain that and to be, to build confidence and trust in, in these solutions that it's, um, it's by a, a rule-based world order and a, a close both regional and also European cooperation that we can, uh, well, if not fix it, but at least uh, create better solutions. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be for all and every nation state uh, extremely difficult to be able to, to really to meet these uh, threats and challenges. And Ardun, do you, do you see that way forward also? I mean, um, how many... In a sense, as you look across that landscape of problems, what can Norway handle and what is international cooperation essential for? How do you see that way forward? Well, I think international cooperation is essential uh, also for uh, addressing a lot of the, uh, what should I say, issues that would, which are nominally domestic issues. Because in, you know, the current uh, environment with the, uh, the, um, Technology uh, developments with uh, trade, with with, with the basically uh, news, everything happening across borders in instantaneously. You know, the the uh, division between the the uh, domestic policies and international uh, policies is becoming less and less relevant. Mm. But actually, going back to this point about you know taking progress for granted, because I think one thing is that we sort of forgot uh, that maintaining democracy and rule of law and 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 uh, a lot of the f freedoms at home is, is hard work. We also forgot that international cooperation is very hard work. Uh, and there, I think there's, in the same way, there's been a sense that, you know, we had sort of won. You know, the, the ideas we, we sort of, between us, uh, aim to represent had, had won uh, on, on the value of multilateral cooperation, uh, on, the, on the human rights agenda, and actually forgetting that, that this needs to be maintained, it needs to be worked on. Uh, and given that we now see this, uh, you know, this agenda under very strong pressure, I think we, we also need to adjust our level of, of ambition. I think a lot of, a lot of the work, if not most of the work in the international formats over the next years, uh, not to say decades, is going to be about actually defending what we mm. have achieved. Uh, we need to, to sort of, uh, I think, become less focused on the rhetorics and more on the hard work and substance and uh, actually sort of slugging through. So. so let me then ask you, since you've got to that point, before I pass on to Cyril and then to Annika. Do you think it is just a question of defending what has been achieved? Or do you think it is 
you know, people often say after disaster the importance of building back better. I mean, is, it, is, is the system as we think it was the system that we should be aiming for internationally? Can we go a bit better? Can we go a bit further? Uh, are we facing completely new problems so that there has to be a paradigm shift? And so, I mean, to what extent can we just defend? To what extent must we create? Well, given that the last sort of paradigm shift in the international order was second, the Second World War, I, I hope we don't have to go back to, to that. Uh, but uh, obviously things can be improved. Uh, but actually doing that development, I think, from a position of uh, you know, relative strength rather than a complete breakdown of the rules-based international order, order mm -hmm. is two very different things. So maintaining what we have while seeking to improve it would be the obvious answer, I think. But okay. So, um, the world uh, works in cycles. So um, we experience times of uh, uh, of crisis, and uh, we experience times of, of of prosperity. And elites, though, to 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 uh, you referred to, tend to to change as well uh, from from time to time. Uh, one of the important uh, task uh, for for us um, when we went out uh, from the um, times of uh, communism was to anchor our presence uh, in uh, uh, in the west based on the on three pillars joining uh, council of europe joining nato joining uh, by joining uh, the the eu and it is very important uh, to uh, to rely on on structures which are at some points guarantors um, uh, that we will be successfully um, cooperating in times of uh, prosperity, but uh, we will be taking all the all the shots uh, uh, in times of uh, of crisis. Of crisis. Um, Someone um, uh, has told me that uh, at, at some point when we discussed uh, uh, how uh, institutions are slow uh, in uh, reacting to the sudden uh, challenges, new challenges, uh, um, um, uh, someone compared uh, the institution to the tanker. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it, it needs time to take the New, new, new course uh, to to address to uh, to address the issue uh, directly. So, the engines, and this is me now, <laughs> the mm. engines of this uh, and uh, um, uh, 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 tankers. This is cooperation and dialogue. So, the more we cooperate in solving uh, the direct problem. That, that, that we address the, uh, the, the, the quicker we, 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 we could address. Mm -hmm. uh, so we put a lot of faith, uh, we should put a lot of faith in, uh, in, uh, in uh, institutional, institutional multilateral cooperation, even if it's at the first uh, glimpse, uh, it looked ineffective uh, uh, if, uh, if, the, if, the, um, uh, if the challenge is uh, really overwhelming. But um, we we need to uh, we need to uh, just put our engines at full speed at, at that time and uh, and and be be patient because so far and uh, the history of uh, uh, um, modern Europe uh, showed us uh, uh, several times uh, uh, the, the institution worked. Right. So, Annika Ulrich kicked off this round of answers with uh, the glimmer of hope. Do you, again, from your, you share that glimmer of hope? Is glimmer too weak a word, or is hope too strong a word? The institutional framework going forward, how do you sense that to be in relation to the challenges which are faced? I think I'm stealing now uh, uh, an expression that Jan Eliasson uses to, to be a worried or concerned optimist, because if we really want the society and the world to work. We need to be optimistic in the sense that we believe that we can actually influence and 
and change. Um, and I believe, uh, in addition to what, what Ulrich said, that um, we've not dealt well with globalization. We thought that the market would solve everything. We did not really deal with the welfare issues. We strived towards small government. Uh, and I'm sure that we now have to reflect on that and move in another direction where we actually uh, see to it that globalization and free trade and fair trade and all of it can actually deliver in a better sense. And that is why this government has invested a lot in, in, in welfare uh, structures in order to come back to this trust that we all have talked about. Uh, but it's not about moving towards nationalism because we still have to be open and to watch very carefully this power shift that we're living through. Uh, and to uh, try to influence that power shift as, as much as we, uh, as we can. Uh, and this takes me back to sub-regional, regional organizations and global organizations that if we don't find the ways to work together in, at all levels, but also to link with uh, partners that share our values on human rights, democracy, gender equality in other parts of the world, we will not be able to sustain and maybe even build mm. back, back better. And if we look at what we have here, the Nordic Council, Barents, Eurarctic Council, CBSS, the Arctic Council, the Eastern Partnership, uh, the European Union, the Organization of, of Security and Cooperation in, in Europe, uh, we are very well off and we should make very good use of all our institutions that would actually make us work well together and provide these assurances that we were talking about. And if, if we look at other regions, a very typical one, uh, the Korean Peninsula and Northeast Asia, no uh, security or collaborative arrangements present by, through, between the countries concerned. If we look at the MENA region, the Middle East, no such arrangements uh, between the countries that stand against each other's uh, partly supported by big powers. Um, and if we want to see uh, everyone live up to the UN Charter and also the European Security Order for, for, for our sake, uh, we need to support all these um, mechanisms and avoid more leaders believing that the world is a zero-sum game. Right. So institutions, rule-based and therefore cooperative, but more than that, Trying to, trying to connect with, well, between governments, between governments and people, between what we've called the elites and people. It's a huge, it's a huge agenda. Yes, but um, we, are, we are many, aren't we? Right. And we have a rich institutional framework to do it. So we really, what are we saying? Um, we have all the tools that are needed. We just have to get on with the job. Is that essentially the view of the panel? Yeah? It's good enough. Okay, well, you know, I think that's a nice uh, place to be finishing this, uh, this discussion, this part of the meeting. Would you please uh, join with me in thanking the, the panel for their discussion this afternoon? As I mentioned to you before, there's a, there's a, a little bit more to do for, for wrapping up. Please stay in your places. We're going to leave the stage. There'll be a, a little bit of a rearrangement here, and, and on we'll move. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you.
Well, dear friends, uh, we are coming to the end of this uh, meeting. It's been a very intense uh, 24 hours meeting. For me, uh, it's been a learning journey as I've been here for the whole meeting. Learned a lot from the uh, keynote addresses, uh, the plenary discussions, and the breakout sessions. I attended the one on uh, resilience to extremism in the morning and the one on the Arctic Council, the strategy for the Arctic Council in the afternoon. Uh, we have, uh, or rather, our excellent uh, CIPRI colleagues have uh, done a little bit of uh, filming uh, of some of you during the day and the beginning of the meeting. So uh, we will probably now see four and a half minutes of your expectations for this meeting. And then you will have, ask, have to ask yourself, did, did the meeting meet your expectations? We will see uh, how, how you consider the results of this intense 24 hours. So over to the filmmakers to come back to my Oscars uh, metaphor earlier. We now more than ever have to realize that security starts at home. For a long time we have seen it in the context of hard security, military uh, and political aspects. But uh, we need in today's world to look at it from the perspective of uh, how a society functions, how vulnerable uh, societies are, uh, how we give the sense of protection and safety in a country so that people also start more than today to trust uh, the de democratic institutions we have. The notion of security has many dimensions and during this uh, conference the focus will be on the broader aspects of security about threats and challenges that don't care about borders uh, or national flags. These security threats, be they climate change, epidemics or the nuclear threat, affect us all and we need to act together to face them. Because uh, the threats that we are confronted with uh, are basically the same for the whole region. The challenges to society security are here and given the broad definition of the concept as we heard today, I mean there always will be some and they change and they evolve and transform. Without regional cooperation, we will not be able to protect our citizens from any borderless challenges. And without regional cooperation, we will not be able to give our children and grandchildren the future they deserve. I like to say, that our region is whole and free. I like to say that, but I know I can say it is not yet safe and secure. We have a military tension that of course affects society and it's important that we do everything we can to lower that tension and we have long-term challenges like climate, environment and also uh, cyber threats, organized crime, trafficking in human beings. Everybody needs to act. Everybody needs to act. Uh, countries themselves, international organizations, uh, regional initiatives. What we can see for the Baltic region is really a great opportunity. A great opportunity of collaboration in order to reduce the risk of disasters, but also a great opportunity to make use of what already exists in the region. I think that information is important, but I think from our research, we have climate communication experts working in our team, it's, it's that we have a lot of information, that, that, and we, we, it's acknowledged, but it's not used. So it's rather that we need these, what you also were referring to, the dialogues, creating the platforms for interacting. Oh, in, in, in our perspective, everything is a success story, because if you look at our starting point 27 or 28 years ago, in that case, of course, nearly everything is a, a success story. But what I 
block and underline is of course the economical cooperation. Well, I think the discussions both yesterday and this morning have really shown us how uh, mutual these challenges are. These are not limited to uh, a geographic region as such. These are, are challenges that uh, all our societies face. I think we need more uh, arenas like this to discuss uh, the priorities actually because there are many things we can do. We live in a world of uh, trust deficit and we have to make sure now that the good forces are mobilized around the principles of democratic societies and societies where we accept also international cooperation. Well, first of all, we've got serious challenges to face, intersecting issues such as climate change, the challenges of the digital age, urbanization, criminal activities like nuclear smuggling, human trafficking, issues such as the uh, spread of um, virulent diseases. So there are real problems. These challenges need cooperative solutions and they need solutions which think outside their own narrow boxes. The institutional framework for doing that actually exists already. It doesn't need to be invented. There is a rich framework of uh, institutional architecture here with experience on these issues and big work to do, but all the capacity to be able to do it. Did we do all that? Evidently we did. Anyway, uh, we will soon uh, here listen to uh, Margaret Wallström and Dan Smith having a concluding conversation here at the very end. But before that, uh, let me just uh, give you some impressions of my takeaways from this, these past 24 hours. I think the uh, concluding discussion here at the plenary was very aptly ending on the, uh, on the discussion on trust. And uh, the fact that these discussions that have been to some degree technical, and many of you in your daily work uh, don't put it in this perspective, they actually deal with how high the quality of our institutions are and how well we satisfy the citizens' expectations, the people's expectations on what we as democratic institutions or leaders or leaders of organizations are doing. And, and uh, therefore, I think this um, discussion on um, societal security is very, very deep. It reaches into this issue of we have to manage the trust deficit in the world because otherwise very dark forces will utilize this lack of trust and simplify the world in such a way that they will lose, we will lose, the values that we have stood for and that have been built up by our parents and grandparents and the values that are written down in important uh, documents like the UN Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So we got to mobilize the good forces right now and I think but this is my most important takeaway, take, take the value of work on institutions and the importance also of inclusion to make sure that everyone is on board and that we don't forget the groups that are outside and, and lose the, have lost the sense of belonging. And here, that's very interesting that this conference, for me, unexpectedly led to that very deep conclusion. The second thing is that I was reminded of Shakespeare's uh, Romeo and Juliet that I was asking myself coming back from five years as Deputy Secretary of the UN, where is the world? But it came back. It came back roaring today with references to the Sustainable Development Goals translated to the Nordic Baltic area. It came back through the discussion on disaster risk reduction and Sendai, the Sendai document. It came back in the climate agreement. And that, I think, should be a mark for us in the Nordic Baltic area, that we are truly internationalists and truly globalists. And uh, I was so glad that this global dimension came in so strong here at the, the second day. Uh, another third thing is prevention. I want to uh, could develop that further, but the fact that prevention was stressed so strongly, in connection not least with the discussion of disaster risk reduction, is so important. I, I think we all should think about, in all areas of life, 
we should listen to the vibrations. The vibrations, and when we see the dangers, we have to act early. And we cannot wait for the serious situations to go into a situation where we lose control. And I think that's another part of the importance of prevention. And my last thought was on the discussion that took place in the plenary this morning on, on the long-term, the lack of long-term thinking. There was a discussion whether the polit politicians or the business community was good at or bad at long-term thinking. But I think that there is now a growing sense of responsibility that uh, the long-term thinking has to be applied. And I think growingly, both in politics and in the business community, as I have followed it, uh, there is a sense that doing the right thing, and we know all what doing the right thing is, is growingly also the enlightened self-interest. That to take a responsibility for the next generation, to take responsibility for this world, the climate change battles, is something we have to do. I met a Korean minister uh, who was the most knowledgeable on uh, the sustainable development goals some time ago. And I asked him, uh, he was the finance minister, and the finance ministers usually don't know the sustainable development goals very well. So I asked him, why, do, why are you so good at the SDGs? And he said, well, you know, I'm not only finance minister. I'm also minister of economic planning. And I have to take responsibility for what happens after this mandate period. That is something. So let's start a movement to make finance ministers also responsible for long-term planning. <laughs> and responsibility for the planet. So uh, thank you so much for coming. I will now leave the stage to, uh, to Margaret Wallström. I'm so glad that we could do this conference together. Uh, Margot uh, uh, Wallström and the ministry with Annika Söder, all the colleagues. We have had wonderful cooperation between CIPRI and, and the government. And uh, this is a typically uh, good example of that cooperation. So if I ask uh, Margot to come up together with Dan and then you can have a little conversation here yeah. and make yes, that you. the concluding part of the meeting. Thank, thank you. you. So for once I'm not moderating. Margaret, you get to ask the first oh, question. Yeah. Thank you very much. And um, so that I, I don't forget, I, I want to start by thanking CIPRI, all the people involved in prepare, preparing for, for this and and, and uh, making uh, this come true. And also my colleagues uh, at the foreign ministry, you've done a, a great job. Um, this is the strangest thing that you put uh, foreign ministers to. One of the strangest things we have to do mm -hmm. is very often we start a conference and then we go away and do everything else and then we're asked to come back and sort of summarize the conference. Uh, mm. This is <laughs> simply impossible. But uh, luckily I've had a special envoy sent also to this uh, present uh, here and sent to this conference as well. So I know fairly well what has been going on and following it very closely. Um, I think some one of you tweeted, um, I, I can't remember who, who said uh, um, in, in a tweet that not only do we share the same sea, the Baltic Sea, but we're in the same boat. Yeah. And I think that that is maybe the, uh, the whole, uh, the summary of this. We're in the same boat and we have to um, figure out how to live together. What is, what is your, we heard also what Jan's takeaway yeah. was from this conference. What, what is your takeaway, Dan? Well, I mean, if you start with the metaphor of the boat, you know, it's not leaky, it's not capsizing, it's, it's, it's there, it's, re it's reasonably good. Um, it needs to be sailed or powered or rowed in the right direction. But there are the possibilities, as I said at the end of the film. I mean, the institutional framework is there, and actually the capacity is av available to be addressing these issues. Can I just follow on your thanks to Cipri by saying it's also been a pleasure to work with the foreign ministry uh, on, on this. And could I, I can't see all Cipri staff, but there's three or four standing at the back. So can you just turn around very quickly and give them a round of applause? Because I, I think they really do deserve it. In, in and the applaud middle. The, the, the Ministry of the MFA people as well. As well, yes. 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 <laughs> of course, that was implicit. Yes. I mean, I think that what, for me, because of what I've been working on in research over the last 10 years, one of the most interesting things I thought was when we 
came to this discussion this morning about, you know, resilience is resilient. If you're resilient to one thing and one set of problems, you're resilient to another, just like a healthy body uh, carry, is, has a stronger immune system. And that, I think, is what societal security in the end is about. If one is able to be answering these, these problems, which were listed in the movie and so on, if one's able to map out those risks, as Banks and Dalius was emphasizing yesterday, on the, if it's possible then to be developing the, the basis for trust in the kind of information, then you can have, be confident that society at community level or at government level will be able to absorb difficult information, look it straight in the face, decide how to act on it, and, and do so. And there's that, it's that kind of... It's that question of that underlying strength mm. of societies. Mm. That, that's what we're aiming for. This has been part of the bigger discussion and everything that's been going on outside this building today, namely uh, the summit between uh, yes. Trump and Kim Jong-un. And, uh, of course, um, build confidence building and building trust was very much part of how do we go from, from here? What happens now? Can we trust the North Koreans? Can, can we trust Trump to, to stay true to the, the deal uh, that he <laughs> has just made? Uh, what, what happens now? So that, that is absolutely uh, uh, true. And uh, resilience is, means also that we will uh, then be able to be more critical to uh, fake news and, and what yeah. have you. We will be um, um, stronger uh, together if we discuss these issues. And I've been in so many meetings uh, discussing um, with the other Nordic countries, with the Baltic uh, Sea States, uh, and uh, most of the time, I must say, we have placed sort of the military security highest up on our agenda because of the, the situation as, as it is and the tensions that we see. Um, but um, often you miss also that dimension of discussing uh, security in a broader yeah. uh, broader uh, view. And uh, I think that this has been part of our deliberations here in a, in, a, in a great way. Is this only a talking shop, though? I mean, yes, it is a talking shop. But, but how do we translate this into into action now. Uh, we have a chance since we yeah. have the, the high-level meeting of the CBSS uh, next, week. Uh, next week already. So that would be one opportunity to bring, and I will definitely bring, bring this discussion with me uh, to that event. I mean, there's some material which we can feed through that came out from the, from the breakout groups and indeed from the panels that mm. maybe help. We can do a, you know, a, a short briefing of, of what came out, and not to take up time now. But I think that What's, what people were saying was essential if we're to go beyond the talking into the action is to be understanding that that action happens in lots of different places. And I think this is, this is the kind of challenge that one faces when talking about adaptation to climate change. There's no one big thing you do to adapt to climate change. There's no one big thing you do to build resilience. There's a myriad of different actions at different kinds of levels, and they all need to be valued and to some degree empowered. Sometimes they need to be resourced. But so they're not all subject to the decisions of your high-level meeting. No. no, and of course I take with me also the, the discussion about uh, young people, and as much as we like to think that we are young forever, uh, we, we, we must make sure that, that also young people are invited, that they are part of, a, of our discussions. And unfortunately, I understood sort of the frustration I felt uh, uh, in the panel when they were asked to, to think about how to, what to say to, to young people, so, and, and what can you give, and what can you teach young people. I, I don't think you can teach them much. I think you can only give love. Yeah. I, I think that's the only thing that, that you can, can always uh, well, give uncon unconditional and love and, and hope. And with it, yeah. of course, if you uh, offer the opportunities, comes hope. And that, that is, uh, it's, um, we have a lack of hope uh, today. Uh, and, and that's a very serious uh, situation. But uh, I think there are also practical things that can bring um, y young people together. And then I think as well the point that Ulrich made, which is that it's not just a division between, in a sense, the old and the young, <laughs> putting myself but nobody else in the camp of the old. 
Um, it's also a division between those who regard, we regard ourselves as expert or we have power and we have influence and everybody else. Mm -hmm. And then that's where, I mean, what Jan said about the trust deficit is so important. That needs, that trust, that sense of solidarity between citizens and governments, that sense of accountable authority mm -hmm. that governments are supposed to, to have, mm -hmm. that, that needs to be rebuilt with confidence as, as we move ahead. So this was a place, a platform for, for dialogue, for both building trust and hopefully providing some hope as well. For, mm. and, and some practical and ideas. And some very practical ideas that yeah. we will all of us have to take with us uh, back home and um, just continue uh, yeah. to work uh, together. In the row the same boat or whatever we are doing, I don't know, sailing or rowing. Well, whatever what it think? is, what doing it together. I think, well, maybe we're rowing, but you know, I'm old, so I prefer an outboard. <laughs> <myself. laughs> okay, can you row? Yes, of course can I can. Roll, I'm, yeah. I'm no, English, no, of course no, I can no, roll. Really. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think my education was, Margaret? Okay, so look, everybody, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for I coming. hope you found it interesting. Thank you, Margaret, for this thank final you. session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was different.